Turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. That's Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. It, it reads this way. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their properties and possession to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple church. They broke bread in their, their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What we see is the account, the description of the very first church. And it's exciting to read that because of the dynamics and the, the, the spiritual interaction that those individuals were having on that day. But it doesn't take us too long to recognize that, that oftentimes the churches that we attend, the places where we go to worship, can be much different than that first description. And so our church has been going through a series entitled, This Is Us. And this particular sermon addresses the church. And so the title of this message is Truth Be Told. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes with you is simply give you uh, six lies that we tell ourselves about church. Six lies that we tell ourselves about church. And then uh, we're going to talk about the truth be told and, and what the truth is about the church. So here we, here we go. The first lie that we tell ourselves is that church is filled with people who have their lives together. That church is filled with people who have their lives together. And, and simply, simply put, oftentimes what takes place is that we put on our Sunday best, we put our best foot forward, and oftentimes there's a lack of authenticity, a lack of, of realness, a lack of genuineness um, in church. And really, when we think about the truth, the truth be told is that church is a hospital, Church is a place where people who have been broken and have had lives filled with sin and mistakes come uh, for the redemption, for the cleansing of sin, to be reminded of who Jesus is and how he's affected their lives. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, uh, and this is a, a, an epistle written by, a book written by Paul, it says this in verse 22, For I joyfully concur with the, the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law in my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Even the Apostle Paul recognized that the things that he wanted to do, he couldn't do, and the things that he shouldn't be doing, he did. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, it says this, Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay a hold of that for which also I have laid a hold of, by the body of Christ Jesus. James chapter 3 verse 2 says this, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And then 1 John 1.8 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What we recognize about church is it's a place filled with imperfect people with a perfect Savior. And so oftentimes we can tell a lie that just simply isn't true. Well, there's a second lie that oftentimes we tell ourselves about church, and that is church is a place where I should get my needs met. I've been in the ministry a lot of years, and I've had time and time people come to me and, and make that statement is that I simply do not have my needs being met in this context or in this way or with my children or with a particular teen. And, and that's a lie that we tell ourselves. Oftentimes, our hearts are excuse centers that keep us from the truth by manufacturing lies. Well, truth be told is that church is a place where I meet the needs of others. 
And that's not just something that I make up, but rather we find it in Scripture over and over again that as we come together as a family, a community of believers, it's important for us to see our part and how that God wants us to serve the body. In Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, it says this, All the believers were together, had everything in common, and they sold property and possession to give to anyone who had need. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 says this, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking at himself, so that you too will not be tempted. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, therefore fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his work, and then he will have reason to, for boasting in regard to oneself and not in regard to one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. When we put the focus on others, it gives us a unique opportunity to minister in that body, in that community. We must not believe the lie that church is a place where we receive. And certainly within our culture, uh, we recognize that we live in days where that, that the consumer mindset has bled itself into and poured itself into the, the local church. May it not be the case but that we would serve others, that we would think of others first. A third lie that we oftentimes uh, believe about church is this. Student ministry will raise my child into a godly adult. All I have to do is drop them off. We see over and over again where the parents um, forsake the responsibility that they have in raising their children up. And, and they believe a lie that, well, if I just drop my child off, if I just have my teen involved in a, in a youth ministry, that that, that will be the, the way for my child to, to come to know Christ. But when we look at the Scriptures, we see something much different in terms of the admonition that God gives to parents. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the first admonition is to children, and then the second part is to parents. It says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then a quote from Exodus 20, we see, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it will be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. In verse 4, it addresses fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Very specifically, the parent has the primary role. Churches come alongside and support families. But fathers are to discipline. That word discipline means to narrow. So the, the fathers and mothers are to, to shape their child in such a way that as they attend a church or are a part of a faith community, that there is partnership. And Ephesians, or uh, 2 Thessalonians, uh, verses five, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, it says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So the lie that oftentimes that we believe is that student ministry is the way to raise my child. The truth be told, churches support intentional and involved parents. That churches support, they come alongside parents through the ministries. And so let me encourage you today, if you're, you're a part of a faith community, get involved in the area in which your, church, your child is, is presently being served. If they're a child... Be involved in the children's ministry. If they're a youth, a volunteer to be a youth leader. There's a fourth lie that we often tell ourselves about church, and that is this. Church is an item on a list of things to do and a place to go. Church is an item on a list of things to do and a place to go. 
It's very alarming when we look at the statistics um, of the American culture of church that most people attend church 1.9 times a month. 1.9 times, times a month or 24 times a year. Well, it doesn't take too long to recognize that the state that we're in, the crisis that we have with the family, uh, has a direct connection with our involvement to a local body. Well, in reality, truth be told, church is a vital part of a believer's existence while on the planet. In Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, it says this, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each the measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, all members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. Since we have the gift that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says this, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Rome, or 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of Easter, of each and every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. First Peter chapter 4, verse 9 says, Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Well, I read these verses to help us all see that, that to live in community requires a commitment level. It requires time. It requires attentiveness, that each person has a gift, an ability that they bring to the, to the assembly. So for it to be um, uh, an item on a list that you check off on a Sunday or, or something to do uh, of many things that you do is really errant. We recognize that, it, that the church is a vital part of our, our time on earth. And as we give and share and love with one another, Jesus Christ is glorified. He is the only uh, focus when I mean, it relates to, to how we glorify Him by being representative of Him as the love of Jesus flows through us to someone else. There's a fifth lie that we tell ourselves. And that is this. I do not need to attend church to be a growing Christian. I do not need to attend church to be a growing Christian. Well, that's a lie that we oftentimes tell ourselves. But in that process, we're ignoring some, some very specific admonitions that the New Testament uh, tells believers to be involved in. Truth be told is that you cannot obediently follow Jesus without committed relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus founded his church. It's the only organization, only institution of which he created or founded. So it's pretty critical that we look to the word of God to recognize how we are to operate, what we're to do, how faithful we need to be to this community, this body, this family with our brothers and sisters. You know, it says in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Can you imagine being a part of a faith community where that because of the fact that, that, that the Spirit was moving and the people were excited to receive the Word of God, that the service just continued on through the, into the night? We're excited to read that passage simply because we can capture the heart of that group of people and the passion that Paul had as he preached the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. You may be familiar with this passage, but it really gives us the, the rock-solid command 
from Scripture as to how often we're to be involved in a faith community. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the days drawing near. Well, what we find here is the admonition that we have a task, we have a responsibility as believers to stir up, to encourage, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That we would be people who we would be encouraging one another no matter what the person beside us is going through. That we would come alongside them and that we wouldn't find ourselves making excuses, telling ourselves lies as it relates to the importance of regularly assembling ourselves together with our, our local church. There's one last lie that we want to just touch on. As we wrap this up, this lie is this, that the measure of a good church service is based on how much I've enjoyed it. We live in a day where that entertainment, we live in a day where that preference is a high premium to the consumer, to those who um, are participating in, in, in church services. But when we look at the, the, the scriptures, when we examine uh, the, the sum total work of, of the epistles, we find that, that there's a, a dynamic within a church. There is a, a sense of community. There is a, a sense of togetherness, a sense of family that, over, that supersedes personal preference, that supersedes um, what we enjoy, but rather what we see is that the measure of a good church service is based on how God is glorified. We see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, Therefore, lay aside all falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. I often liken the church to the, the family dynamic. We know that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it doesn't take us too long that we can use the example of family and how we would go interacting with one another. If a family wants to go out to eat, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, each person might have a different preference, a different way that they, uh, or, or type of food that they like, or, or a different way that they like to eat. Some people want fast food. Others want to sit down. Some people like Mexican. Others in the family like Italian. But a family that has a good dynamic, a good function, uh, they're looking toward the others in the family and not themselves. And so we see in Ephesians chapter 5, the dynamic of, of, of church life. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Three really different types of music. One is the psalms, and we recognize in the scripture that there were 150 psalms written in the Bible. Uh, those were used uh, as an element of worship of which primarily David wrote those psalms. And they were put to meter and to, into music, and they were sung by the choirs um, in the Jewish temples. But then there are hymns, and we have a, a, a huge volume of hymns written through the last several hundred thousands of years, of which we can look back and sing hymns of, of writers who wrote about their stories, of how God had touched their life and who God is. And then we see that there's a third type of, uh, of, of song, which is a spiritual song. Choruses that are written. And what we know is that there are a, 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 a broad variety of music that we can use and we sing them to one another, speaking to one another. So music is there to bless those that are around us. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things. 
Church is a place where that we would come together and praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of God for what he's doing, what he's done, and what he's going to do. And as we see God work in the lives of other people, we're encouraged because we know that he is also going to be working in our situation, in our lives, in the lives of our children and family. Giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God even the Father. So the dynamic that we see in the scriptures is one of which we're there to encourage others and and therefore we measure our experience by how God is receiving the glory and not so much about how I'm enjoying it or not enjoying it. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 it says this, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves. So when I tell myself the lie that the measure of a good church service is based on how I've enjoyed it, I've already stepped out of the admonition, the command that we're given in Scripture not to think that way, but rather to think about others. Think others about others in the room that I might be worshiping in or on the campus of which that I am attending. So I do nothing. We do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but we humble ourselves. So we place ourselves in our minds and our hearts in a position where that we elevate others and we decrease in our importance. So what we see, and we could share with you many other lies that that are told, many lies that we create to diminish the impact that the local church can have on us. But these six particular lies I've found to be ones of which I've sometimes have told myself and certainly I've heard other people share and, and, and tell themselves. And what happens is it diminishes Um, our experience within the family, and then we miss our opportunities to impact, to minister, to encourage to those around us. So as we wrap up our time, what I'd like to do is just take a moment and ask a few questions that you might need to be asking yourself as you listen to this message when you think about your local church experience. When you go to church, Are you thinking about those around you? Are you thinking about the needs that you need to have met? Well, we know from Scripture what we need to be looking at and toward is those around us and how that we can minister. When was the last time that you prayed for your leaders, your church family, the mission and vision of your home church? Well, you may be saying, well, I really don't have a home church. Well, let me encourage you. To find a church that is Bible-believing in your area where that you can pour into the lives of other people. Where that you can grow in your understanding of, of who God made you to be and what He would have you to do. And then as a pastor, been a pastor for a long time, I know just how absolutely critical it is for those within the church to be lifting up their leaders. And so some church structures have elders, others have deacons, others have deaconesses, others have maybe just pastors. Whatever the structure of your church is, let me encourage you just right now to take that opportunity to pray for your leaders, in particular your pastor. I know this, it's not an easy job. It is a calling that God gives to men and therefore it comes with a cost. That cost is oftentimes the evil one is out to do what? Distract, discourage, and tempt that leader. And so for us as a body, if we can encourage those pastors, those leaders through prayer, that's going to make all the difference. Maybe from this, you'll just take the opportunity to share with a leader that, hey, you know what? I prayed for you today. I recognize the work that you do and the difficulty that that has. Well, what lie are you telling yourself? What, what have you created in your mind that you continue to, to manufacture that is, is keeping you from doing and being all that God wants you to do and be in the local church? 
Well, let me encourage you today is to speak the truth, to thank the truth. And as we've looked at these scriptures, that you would use them as a platform to be able to grow and experience the ministry that God has for you in your local church. Well, if you don't have a local church, let me encourage you, if you're in the Quincy area, I'm Pastor Bob Kalman. I'm from Columbus Road Church. And in that, we have many ministries. We have a 9, a 10.30, and a 5.30 worship service each and every Sunday. And those services uh, also have provided with them nursery, children's ministry, and youth ministry. But I also want to just share something with you for a moment because I know that some of you might be going through a difficult time. And we have a ministry called Grief Share on Sunday evenings at 6.30. If you've lost a loved one, you're going through a difficult death, we have a ministry that can encourage you along in the process of healing. And maybe for others, you're going through a, a divorce right now. And, and, and certainly, that's a difficult time. And, and you're trying to navigate so many things and, and wanting to listen to God and hear what He has to say as it relates to what your future is. We have a divorce recovery ministry. And that is also at 6.30 at our church on Sunday evening. We have Celebrate Recovery. If you're going through a difficult addiction or, or, or a, a, a difficult time, whether you're having a struggle with a particular area of your life, that's for you. So I just want to share with you that we have ministry. If you don't have a home church, if you have a home church, support it. Be involved. Encourage your pastors. Serve with your gifts. And recognize that the church, the local church is where it's at. That God has placed many local churches in many communities to do His work. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity You've given us to speak into the lives of people on, in this day. And I pray that Your church would be lifted up. And that we wouldn't tell ourselves lies, but we would believe the truth from Scripture that your church is an assembly of believing brothers and sisters to glorify you, to accomplish your mission, and to build the kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And sweet is the way. Yes. yes, that's it, brothers and sisters.